um, our little lamb, our little damsel that is raised from the dead. Um, it is in three different places. In um, It's in Mark, it's in Luke, and her story is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, this is our girl. Her name is Talitha Coombe. Um, and you can read about her story, like I said, in those three Gospels. Um, I have this outline. I'm also providing you with the shadow guide. So what this is, is this is where you should drop your shadows. When you're painting, when you're coloring, when you're markering, when you're using crayons, whatever medium you're using, this is where you want to drop your shadows. Remember that your drawings and your paintings only come alive through the lights and the darks. Every, if you leave everything in a mid-tone, it just looks that way. It looks blah. Pop up your shadows, pop in some white, and boom, your drawing comes to life. So here is what Talitha is going to look like in all of her glory. Is she not the cutest thing you have ever seen? So her, um, all of her package is available over on praiseheart.net under DigiGirls. I'll have the link below. Um, I have it in PDF and JPEG. There was a whole bunch of scuttlebutt over on um, the... Uh, over on the Facebook page about PDF and JPEG and all this kind of stuff. So listen, if there's ever a file that you need, just drop me a note. If you've purchased it and you need some other form of it, just drop me a note and I will just shoot it right on out to you. No big thing, chicken wing. But I do always try to put the JPEGs and the PDFs in. So, okay, let me start going in. You know what, wait, before I even start, I have to say to you that I'm using the Illustrating Bible. I have gessoed the pages because if you don't gesso the pages with watercolor, um, they just, uh, they just, it just sucks in the paint and it doesn't, you can't move it or manipulate it. So with gesso, you're able to manipulate the paint a little bit, but then it all, I mean, I use these watercolors every single day. I know how these watercolors react. I know I, they're friends, you know, <laughs> I, I bring them out, I play with them and I know how they're going to react. It does not react even with the gesso on this Bible like I need it to. You see how it's just, it's almost like greasy. It's just almost like you just push it around on the page. Um, so I, this is a crazy kind of paper. Um, and honestly, I wound up using my Tombow markers and just and just bringing her life with mostly with the Tombow markers. I put down a, a first layer of watercolors to build off of, um, and then I just relied on the Tombow markers to bring her out. This is a crazy paper, crazy, crazy paper. Okay, so with that said, you'll see me um, switch over from the watercolors into the Tombows. But let's get into Mark. So let me set the stage. I'm in Mark 535. Um, and I'm just going to set the, the stage for you that Jesus is walking through a crowd and Jarius comes to him and just drops before him and in just this this weakened state of forlorn and sadness and desperation because his daughter is at death's door. And he drops down in front of Jesus and he asks him to come so that he could save his, his girl. You know, I can't imagine... Quick story here. I can't imagine Jarius leaving the deathbed of his daughter to go find the miracle man, this healer that walks that walks about and does good. You know, he leaves his daughter at her deathbed to find something else. Um, this reminds there was a time my daughter was in school and she's got epilepsy, and there was this um this time she would get this aura she does she gets this aura and and we, she knows that there's a seizure coming and she had been having an aura and she called me and she said mom I'm having the aura and I got in my car but she's an hour away from me at this point right so I get in the car and I'm starting to drive to her but there's a sound that she would make right before the seizure kind of hit her and she makes that sound and I know that my girl is having a seizure and she is alone in her dorm room and she is she is in the throes of a seizure and not not conscious anymore I had to hang up the phone hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I had to hang up the phone and hang up that connection that I had to her. And I had to call the front desk of the dorm and tell them to rush up to my daughter. She was having a seizure. I can't imagine Jarius walking away from his little girl on her deathbed to go find the healer, this man that does miracles. Just imagine the absolute desperation in this man's spirit as he drops in front of Jesus. 
So, meantime, back at the ranch, the woman that has been, Jairus' daughter is 12, and this woman that has been bleeding for 12 years touches him. And he says, I feel the energy that's come out of me. Who's touched me? Can you imagine the desperation of Jarius as Jesus is waylaid? <laughs> Can you imagine? In my, for my story, the ambulance took four hours ever to get there I was on the phone with the RA the whole time and just saying where in the world is the ambulance where in the world is the ambulance imagine Jarius as Jesus is waylaid and as he says the words I felt the energy expel from me have you ever approached Jesus in your prayer life with that kind of idea that he's only got a certain amount of healing. He's only got a certain amount of miracles. Maybe he used up all those miracles way back in the day when he was walking on the earth. Maybe there's not enough time, attention, or need in your certain miracle. Maybe he's used it up for just the person right before you. Maybe that got all of the miracle and all the healing, and you'll just have to take the scraps. I want you to hear me say to you that is not our God. Our God does not call us to the scraps. He calls us to the table. He does not call us to eat amongst the dogs from the scraps of the table. He invites us to dine at the table in the, in the presence of our enemies. If that is a mentality that you suffer from, that poverty spirit that says, there's not enough for me, he's too busy, I can't ask him, I would ask you to go to that root belief system and try to figure out where that's coming from and root it out of your spirit because that is not truth. If the enemy can convince you that you're not worthy of the biggest miracle God has ever had, then, there, then you're not living in the truth. So Jarius has to wait, you know, and, and, and I love this part. I love this part. So the woman is healed and the energy has released from him. And then this, the servant comes and he says to him, oh God, don't pester. Literally, it means pester here. Don't pester the master. Your daughter is gone. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. And, and the thing is, is that in this place, Jarius is, is in a place where the miracle depends on physicality and on touch. It depends on him being in the same place as his daughter and him touching his daughter. Do you, do you, do you? Find God in a box and see that Jesus can only do a miracle when he's close or when he can touch? Do you believe that just praying for something or somebody matters? It makes a difference. It, it, it knocks on the doors of heaven. Quick story again. Um, I get woken up a lot in the middle of the night to pray for people. And I don't question it anymore. I just pray. So um, I'm not, I'm going to change names here or not mention names, but I had been working with um, heroin addicts and going into the prisons and working with um, some heroin addicts. And I, I might've told the story before, but it matters here. So I had an appointment to meet with this one girl and her friend after she got out of prison um, and we were just going to sit and have talk, talk and just kind of do a catch up on like, so okay, what are your next steps? What are you thinking? You know, so I had met her in prison. I had done Bible studies with her. I had relationships so that when like, she came on the outside that I could help her establish her ways in a more productive, healthy way when she was on the outside. So, but that like up at midnight, praying for this child, praying, interceding, like tossing, turning, thrashing, praying with such a sense of urgency. I couldn't get the words. It was just the groanings of my heart to him. It, it was unbelievable. And it went on for hours. So I just, I just travailed for this child and I just interceded and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. So everything's going and you know, you, you just know when somebody's sort of pulling the BS on you and just like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I could just sense that she wasn't being real anymore, that the world had caught her back up again. And she was, she had her eyes set on different things. And so I just said to her, tell me what happened. What was happening with you last night, let's say between 12 and two. And she just turns white 
And she says, and she looks at her friend and she says, why would you even ask me that? I said, because I was up. I was not just praying for you. I have prayed for you like I rarely pray for anybody. The Lord had me, you in my grips. I was praying for you so tightly. So it turns out that she had overdosed and she was dead. And and the thing is, is that in this in this culture, in this community, when you overdose, they don't want it to, and everybody around you doesn't want to get like, you know, bogged down with that whole deal. So they sort of just leave you to die. They'll put you someplace so that somebody else will find you and um, just leave you be, you know. So her friend had stayed with her and didn't know what to do. And it was an alley and it was dark. And all of a sudden, she was blue. She was blue. And I want to say to you, that God does not depend on anybody being there to touch her, to say Talitha Kum to her. He had me up praying in the middle of the night. And Talitha Kum, he rose this child from the dead so that she could live again. Our Jesus is not dependent on time. He's not dependent on physicality. He's not dependent on any kind of limitation that we can put on him. Let your faith be bigger than any box you ever want to put our God in. So, okay, so he, um, so Jarius, they walk over to, to the, to the place. Uh, Jesus says, believe just you believe. Do not fear. Believe. Jesus knows when we are in fear. Jesus knows when we are not, our faith is not there. So here's the deal. In this place, he says to, um, he says to Jarius, Pisteo, Pisteo, believe. Okay, so you love that, right? Because he's saying to commit your trust, to place your confidence in me. Jarius, trust me. Believe in me. Ah, but Hidden in within the word of pisteo is this beautiful wrinkle that it also means to entrust one's spiritual well-being to Christ. So hear that, that Jesus is already going multi-layer, multi-layer, multi-layer. He's not just saying, I need you to believe in me. Jarius, I need you as the head of this household to entrust your spiritual well-being to me the head of this synagogue, this wealthy man who's in charge of a synagogue, Jesus looks right at him and says, I need you to trust me with your spiritual well-being. Wow. Jesus cuts through every status quo, every paradigm that Jarius has in that minute with one word, believe. Do you believe? So they get to the house, they go on to the house, and they get to the house, and everybody's laughing. And, and the thing that, that strikes me here is that Jesus could not perform a miracle when he was in his hometown. And, and I have to wonder, I don't know what that means, but to me, it means that negativity and doubt and sarcasm and cynicism, it, it changes the atmosphere of, a, of, of us being like conducive to a miracle. It literally alters the atmosphere, negating the holy, crowding it out. Like where, where is our mind? Where are our thoughts? Where, where are we thinking? Are we his friends and his family when he goes on home and we don't believe that this, that Jesus could do this? Jesus can't do this. Well, I would have to offer to you, this is just my own thinking and my own paradigm. But if, if that's our base, our core belief system, Jesus can't do it. With the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. But you got to have a mustard seed. you got to have a something that he can touch and he can grow and he can move. So Jesus leaves them all outside. He's like, you know what? No, it's, it's James, John, Peter, mom, and dad get to go in and witness the miracle. He leaves all of that other crap outside and it's not allowed into the holy manifestation presence of God that's going to come in and settle upon this little girl. So he says, um, he says to this little girl, Talitha Kum, and what I love, he says it in Aramaic. Aramaic is a is one of the popular tongues of the time, the dialect of the time. So um, Mark actually, I think, is the only he is the only one that quotes the Aramaic expression. 
because he wants his readers, his readers to understand what was said and what it meant. This is a this is a debate. This is a big debate that's going on. Like biblical scholars are debating about this, but there is, in some instances, a wrinkle where in Talitha Kum, it, Kum is this idea of a little lamb, rise little lamb. And you know what, I say let the biblical scholars debate all they want because what I like is that there's a chance that my shepherd in that moment, my shepherd who walks through the valley of the shadow of death says to this little girl, rise my little lamb. Her shepherd came for her and rescued her. He holds her hand. He holds the physical body that is that is broken now, that is not responding anymore. He says to this, to Jarius, trust me with the well-being, your spiritual well-being. Trust me with this. And he says in this moment to this crowd, to these people, this child, this damsel is not dead. Now imagine he's holding her physical body, but here this word is paid on. And what that means, a wrinkle in the, found within the wrinkles of this word, is that this is an immature Christian. This immature Christian is not dead. I can't even imagine Jarius and mom in this moment, all of this going on and happening around them. He holds the hand and he speaks to the spirit. This immature Christian is not dead. The girl that he had me pray over, that immature Christian was not dead. You can have a moment in your life right now where you feel like you have nothing. I want to say to you, believe in your Jesus. Believe and trust your spiritual well-being to him. So he holds this girl, and he says, Paydon, this damsel is not dead, but she sleeps. And he says in Arabic, this is the only place in the Bible that these words are uttered, Talitha kum. He takes this child by the hand and he speaks to her spirit. And I love here that her body is, is not responding anymore. But this speaks to the eternal of our spirit. It speaks to that, that, that which is put in us that is eternal. It's there. It's not like she was dead and she was gone and there was not something that he couldn't bring back again. He brought back the eternal. Just like we can't move mountains without a seed of faith, we have an eternal that he can call back. I find comfort in that as we look at death and we look at dying. We're not, we're not geared for dying. We're geared for eternity. When we lose a loved one, it's devastating. But the fact here that the body is the body is separated from the eternal brings me hope. So um, he calls her now. He says to her that this is he calls her my little daughter. My little daughter um, is is not dead. So Jesus calls her Paidon. Just stick with me. I know this like these words, but I'm such a word geek. So Jesus calls her Paidon, which is immature Christian, and Jarius calls her my little da daughter or thygatrion. And a thygatrion is just just that a physical body. It's it's my little girl. It just when you know what it means, my little girl. Jesus sees beyond my little girl into the body, soul, mind, heart, being of this little girl of little Talitha here. Jesus will show up when we ask him for a miracle, when we ask him into our lives and we ask him to, to manifest his presence, he shows up on so many more levels than we can ask for. We put him in a box. He, he tends to our every single need, not just what we're asking for, not just what we think we need. He attends to everything, every aspect of our being. That's our Jesus 
we might approach him thinking that we've got this like poverty spirit and and you know that whole thing about is there enough is there enough healing left for my daughter you just healed this woman that's been bleeding for 12 years is there enough healing left for my daughter our our god owns a cattle on a thousand hills our god has got an extravagant love language of giving that's his love language I feel like if we as Christians could grab a hold of the extravagance of God, coupled with the righteousness of God, my goodness, we could change the world with our thinking. So, um, so I think I'm just trying to get my head back together again. Whoo, is this not, it's amazing. I just, I just love it all. I think that is most of my thoughts on, um, on, on, on Talitha. I want to, I want to end my thoughts on this one thing is that he calls, Jarius calls her my little daughter and, and she's just a young girl, but he calls her into life. She, he, she's called to live a Zoe life of abundance. And let me just tell you what the Zoe life of abundance that Jesus releases her, brings her back into. The Zoe life of abundance is a life that is active and blessed. It is a life endless in the kingdom of God, eternal. It's full of vigor, it's enjoyment, and it is the real life that we are called to. That's what he calls her back to. And in this last the thing, I always just love the intriguing little details that we get. Jesus says to her, feed her, give her something to eat. And there's thought that the reason that's said is because the, the gospel writers wanted it to be understood that this was not a spirit that was brought back, that her, she was literally brought back from the dead. Her body was working again. Um, but for me, what it says is this caringness, this, this, this love of our Savior. He, he tends to our every need. You, you know that when somebody's on their deathbed, they don't eat. They stop drinking. They stop, they stop eating before they stop drinking. And there's just this, 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 this slow goodbye, you know. And so she probably had not eaten in a bit. And our Savior, we, he's just asking for her to heal her. Do you know, Jarius just wanted her to be healed. He didn't, even, he didn't even think to ask for her to be called back from the dead. He just wanted her to be healed. Jesus does so much more. He always does. He's our Ephesians 3.20 God that always does more than we can fathom or imagine. So don't limit your prayer life by telling him what you need. Invite him in and let him do what he does. <laughs> and let him well, um, define the parameters of your miracle. Don't, don't box him in. Don't box him in. So he, he tells her to give her meat, give her something to eat. And then he says, tell no one. Tell no one. Sometimes he tells people to tell. Sometimes he tell, tells people not to tell. I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know why he does that. There, there's things that say that maybe he doesn't want to be... Um, known as the Messiah yet, that he wants it to sort of stay. My thought on it is, is this, is that they, he asked them to trust the, him with their spiritual well-being. He brought this immature Christian family to full-fledged Christianity and belief in a Savior and a Messiah. Don't go throw your pearls before swine. Don't, don't put the miracle up for interrogation. Don't, don't allow other people into your miracle so that they can rip it apart and tell you what really happened. Allow God to do what he does and, and take root in your heart and know that the miracle is from him. And don't let anybody take that gift from you. That's why I think he said, tell no one. That's just me, though. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed Talitha Coombe. Um, I loved researching her. Have a great day, guys. Bye.